So, it's time to say welcome. Og velkommen til eventet studentmekking på Bioskapeverkstedet. Her på Realfagsbiblioteket på Universitetet i Oslo. I'll continue in English because many of the participants uh, here don't speak Norwegian and so the working language in, is very often English. So welcome to what we've called student tinkering at the Biomaker space. Uh, there. Now, log leave lob. That's the name we've given to a maker space for bachelor students in sciences and at the medicine faculty at the University of Oslo. And the biomaker space has been financed by the UIO Life Science. It's physically in the labs or in the physics department, in the physics building here at the campus. And the life science, the cells, the competence on biology comes from the Center of Excellence Hybrid Technology Hub. So what is a bio makerspace? I'm sure very many of you know what a makerspace is. These makerspaces have popped up everywhere in almost in every city in Norway. There's a makerspace and the point is to make available to people machines, equipment, so that you can take your ideas and put them into action, make something physical out, out of it. There are a lot fewer biomaker spaces in the world. This is the first biomaker space in Norway. So the bio means that we want to let students take biological material and let it meet technology and science in order to make things with living matter and cells and so on. It all started from as a cross-disciplinary initiative with my colleagues Arian, who is a physicist, he's working in electronics, and he's been working on innovation and biomedical devices for many, many years. And also Stefan Kraus, who's head of the Hybrid Technology Hub Center of Excellence. So they are working on organ on a chip, which is a very technologically active field in biomedical science nowadays. And myself, who I'm a physicist, and I'm working on mi using microfluidics and microscopy to study complex systems. So our initial idea about the biomaker space was that life science should meet physics, because we were physicists. And we wanted to give students a possibility to make real science, so that maybe they would even publish mm, the results of what they do. We also wanted to give them the possibility to work with cutting edge te technology. And the most basic thing is that we want them to learn by doing. Um, most maker spaces are kind of drop-in places. You have an idea, you come there, and you use the equipment that's there. But the equipment we've got, and with cells and, the, and all of this, there's too much to learn that people can just come in and play with it right off the shelf. So we wanted it to be project-based. And we uh, have recruited some technology partners that hopefully can also inspire the students mm, when they are working on these things. So we hope that 
and we've seen that students are motivated by actually doing extracurricular things because the first three years of their studies are full of theory but they don't get to do much by themselves and we've seen that the creativity it releases something in them they get to tinker and play and make things and we think that our studies are very disciplinary, so giving them an opportunity to meet people, meet students from other disciplines, is very valuable to the future thinking about what they're going to do. But that was the start. From now on, these students, this is the board mm, that have, are now taking over, and I'm giving the word to them in a minute. So the program of today is to tell you what happened this first semester. Even in the corona times, we were allowed to let the students into the labs that work together in cohorts and with uh, the rule, following the rules. There were 12 students to start with, and there were th they decided on three projects, and they had four fantastic postdocs to supervise them. They've shown an incredible enthusiasm and they've tested our concept, they've tested the equipment. Everyone has learned a lot and now they'll tell you what they've done. And if someone here or who's watching us are interested in joining, we have a room for many more students, so please just go to the website join.loglivelab.no and fill in the form and you can join us. So now to the first group, the bioactuator group. Let's see. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi. I'm Håkon, this is Tengel and Håvard. We are the three members of the three bachelor students of uh, the bio bioactuator project. And uh, uh, also I have to mention Erik Åsammer. Uh, he will he help us a lot throughout the summer. Uh, what we do in the bioactuator project is that we make these bioactuators, which is uh, pretty much a tiny muscle robot. How we make them is that we first have these muscle cells that we grow and uh, put them in a mold in order to shape them to the form we want. We then let them differentiate and finally they become uh, fully contractible muscle tissue. We then attached it to some sort of skeleton body type thing. You can see some illustrations here from one of the papers we uh, have been working on. Uh, or one of the papers you have been reading. Uh, and this one right here will move by uh, when you send short electric pulses into the muscles, it will contract, pulling upon the skeleton, making the two legs move together, and then it will move along almost like a larva. Uh, this might seem a bit intimidating uh, to new students, but I assure you this is um, a perfectly uh, doable project and really fun for new bachelor students. And the first and foremost reason for that is because we have these wonderful supervisors. Karoko and Denise, which have helped us throughout the entire project on each and every step. And um, yeah, they have just been wonderful. Uh, you can, we have also been working with them in the cell lab, both in um, the physics department here at the U and in Domus Medica, as you can see a picture of here. Uh, we have also gotten a lot of help from S Stefan Nervik, which is a physic a physicist. Uh, we do a lot of the technical parts of the project, but we do need more physicist uh, students, I mean by that. Uh, then we come to papers. Papers is the first step of the project in many ways, because you have to read these papers and try to replicate it, because we don't just make up everything we do. You have to replicate it and take inspiration from multiple papers to, to, try, to that try to create these bioactuators. Uh, but we have more ambitions than just replicating. We want, in the end, to be able to advance some of these techniques in creating bioactuators. So. And uh, some of the things we have been experimenting a bit with, which is new, is the cell fibers, which is uh, one of the ideas from uh, one of our supervisors, which is pretty much turning the muscles into some sort of rope, which, which we can more freely manipulate. 
and twist around this by creators. Uh, and now I just want to show you a video of one of the uh, projects we have been most inspired by. As you can see, this is a sort of bioactor that's a jellyfish and can swim freely. That's a pop up. There. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, and now to Hover. Yes, so I'm going to talk about uh, what we do now and our current progress. Uh, so we use a software called Fusion 360 to design both our skeleton and muscle tissue. Uh, we students have no prior expertise in Fusion 360, so if you're going to join us, don't worry about it. Uh, we use 3D printer to print our designs, uh, which is really fun. Uh, we to yeah we culture uh, muscle cells as uh, Hawkon said. Uh, we culture them both in 2D and uh, 3D. 2D will say that we culture them straight in a petri dish, and 3D we culture the muscle cells so they can grow in all three dimensions. Uh, and we mix the healthy muscle cells with uh, collag collagen. Uh, Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we use Soji's uh, cell fibers, which is one of uh, our supervisor, uh, which you can see on this picture right there. The small dots are the muscle cells, and the transparent part is uh, calcium alginate, but it's basically a muscle cell fiber. And here are our results. Uh, this is some of our bioactuators, uh, which I think is really cool. Uh, and our next uh, one big aspect of uh, this project is to stimulate them because we have to make the bioactuator swim. And this we do electrically. Uh, this is usually the physicist part. Uh, and uh, we don't have our physicist anymore. So if is there any physicist, please join us. Uh, we use a pulse generator to stimulate with carbon electrodes. Uh, but there's a lot of possibilities. And here you can see the muscle cells contract uh, in 2D. Uh, this has been done. We have been working them out because they're muscle cells. They have to be worked out, of course. Um, so yeah, we have stimulated them overnight. Uh, and this is a result. And we also managed to stimulate a bioactuator, but it was too strong and uh, ripped itself apart. So now to Håvar. Uh, yeah, uh, my name is Håvar. I'm going to talk a bit about what we're going to do in the future. What we and you heard a bit from Tengel where we are right now. So um, this ne next semester we really want to try and stimulate more of the bioactuator bio itself because we. So far, only stimulated into the bottom of petri dishes, and the one attempt we had, the tissue itself kind of got destroyed. So, um, what we do mostly in the project so far, at least, has been cell culturing. Um, and we're all of us three are biologists, and we think cell culturing is quite fun. Uh, and s like one thing we've been talking a lot about is eventually being able to work with neurons which we think it would be really cool. Um, and eventually working together with the muscle cells and neurons with what's called the neuromuscular junction, um, which is where nerve cells and muscle cells come together uh, and kind of how they work with each other. But we kind of have no idea how to do that. And it's probably really difficult, probably really expensive. So probably the kind of step prior to this would be culturing something called myotubes which are muscle cells kind of merged together. So you can see the, uh, some different pictures here um, with you know, E and F is kind of the optimal uh, myotube where all the cells kind of merge together into one big fiber. And since they're kind of all parallel, they can be a lot stronger since they all pull in the same direction. Uh, and they can, yeah, they can pull a lot more force and 
uh, this is kind of how they are in the body, uh, kind of how they look like in the body. Um, now, probably the most obvious way to take this project would be to iterate on our current bioactive design. So this is the current design. This is kind of like a jellyfish looking thing where we can put the muscle cells around these like poles and then they can pull on the, all the arms and can hopefully swim eventually. Um, so we can make different designs. We can uh, make it swim better because so far it hasn't swum yet. So we don't know how fast it would swim, how much force it would uh, give or, or any of the I mean, fluid dynamics or anything about this. So that's one way to take it. And something we've been talking about internally and with uh, Kayoko, our supervisor, is to make a microfluidic valve. Now, microfluidics, you're going to hear more about later. But we think it would be really cool to make a valve that can open and close using a muscle cell. Um, now, this is a traditional microfluidic valve. This is uses like a pressure system. But we think it would be cool to use muscle cells instead. Uh, and it has never been done before. We have no idea how to do it. It's probably really hard. It would be a challenge. But yeah, it, it, we think it could be fun. Now, um, the possibilities are almost endless. We can do lots of different things. As long as it moves using muscle cells, it's technically a bioactuator. So if anyone has any ideas and want to join, like, just give us an idea and we might be able to run with it. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Very, very nice to see so many of you here wanting to hear about our very exciting lab. Um, Mats and I will be talking about the second group of Lag Live Lab, which is electrorotation. So our group consists of four students, three of which are biology students, and Mats is one of them. And I'm one of the physics students. So as you can see, there are quite a few physicists. So if you are a physics student or a chemistry student, please join us, because we'd love to work together with people from other backgrounds. Our project is a little bit special because it, com it combines three uh, disciplines that you wouldn't really think of combining together, which include electronics, cell biology, and physics. So what we do is very interesting, but we wouldn't be able to do what we do without our just as wonderful supervisors, one of which was, is Oliver, who is a postdoc at the electronics department at the physics building, and Ariane Martinson, who is also a professor at the same department, and they both helped us a lot to understand the theory behind our project and also actually put things together because none of us have any knowledge about electronics. We've never worked with it before, but we were able to learn a lot uh, this semester or this uh, spring semester. So how exactly do we rotate the cells and why do the cells rotate? That's probably the first thing that you're wondering about. Well, it's actually very interesting because we've all learned about cells at some point during our education, but what's making it happen is the electrical properties of the cells. So when you place a cell in an electric field that is specially designed for this rotation, it induces something called a dipole moment on the cells, and then this dipole moment interacts with the field that the cells are placed in and induces something called a torque which actually makes them rotate. And that's because the dipole moment and the electric field are kind of in and out of phase with each other. So they counteract each other, if you want to think about it this way, and they induce a torque. So if you look at the picture below and you focus on either the cell clusters or the individual cells, you will actually notice that they rotate clockwise. And what we were able to do is rotate them both clockwise and anti-clockwise, and then we're able to translate them at some point. And all of this depends on the frequency of the field that we're choosing. And now I will explain a little bit more about the field itself and how we create this field. Because as mentioned before from the bioactuators group, we don't just think of this ourselves. This is pretty hard stuff. And we've based our project on Anders Janssen's master thesis. And he used to be a student at the physics department, at the Department of Electronics. And what he was looking at was this electrochamber that you see in the first picture above. So what he did was he got this electrochamber from another professor in Germany who is working specifically on electrorotation, and he kind of adapted it and put it together with something called a signal generator, so what creates the signals that we then use to create the field, and also something called an oscilloscope, which shows us the 
the shape of the signal. So he put those things together and then he looked at electrorotation of yeast cells. And we've been trying to recreate that to see if we can make this work because then we can apply it to other cells that Mats will talk about a bit uh, in a bit more detail later. So the way this electrochamber works is by using four electrodes. So it's like these tiny uh, dots inside of the chamber. And each one of those creates a signal, and each one of those signals is 90 degrees face shifted with respect to each other. So they're not moving in the same direction, they're kind of delayed uh, with respect to each other, as said before, and this creates this very interesting circular field that we are wanting to get. And the frequency of this field can be changed by us, and depending on this frequency, as I said before, we can do whatever we want with these cells. And the interesting part with this is that it was actually pretty hard to do this. Like you think that we can just put things together because it's been done before, but it was a lot of work because we started with the circuit, with this breadboard, sorry, the one on the left. And as you can see, there are a bunch of wires and none of this made sense because we've never worked with this before. But then with help of Oliver and Orian, we were able to create a circuit board. So the yellow thingy in the right picture. And that actually puts all the components that we need to create this special field in a much neater way, so it actually makes sense and you can actually understand what's happening, which is great. And then what we do is we're able to put it together with the electro chamber on the right, where we place the cells exactly in the middle, and then we observe what happens to them under the microscope. So this is what we've done this semester, and Mats is going to talk a bit more about the biology of it and what we want to do in the future. So yeah. For the biological implication of this, this, it was a lot of physics right now, but the goal of the electrotation is to create what we call a rotation spectra. I'll come back to that later, but this spectra is affected by the electrical properties of a cell. So there are two main parts that affect, kind of affect the electrical properties. Uh, the first part is the membrane capacitance. Uh, you see, around the cell there are kind of a fat layer, a fat wall, you could also say. Uh, itself has also a charge, and there are mo other things in the membrane that also affects this charge. There are also internal membranes that kind of blocks free-flowing ions, and this is what we call the blocks and changes the cytoplasm conductivity. So if ions want to flow this way, they are blocked by structures or fat walls inside of the cell. Uh, this will affect how the electrical field is affecting the cell. And we can assert this later. So, the rotation spectra themselves. Uh, we make this by counting the cell rotations per time unit. So on the right hand side there, you can see that this is radius per second. But the time unit doesn't really matter. Um, and we use this to make cell uh, an, a spectra. For example, Jans Janssen, which this project is based on, has made one spectra right here from many cells. Of course, this is a, it's the same type of cells, so the electrical properties are about the same. So this is a really simple thing to do. However, we, there is possible, you can possibly do this in a medical application. So Tartinosi et al, for example, have uh, applied this to cancer research. They have induced cancer into, into different stages of a cell and then um, compare the spectra, and this could be used in diagnosing uh, diseases or cellular anomalies. So, what we want to do in the future, now that we have the instrument working, we want to use this to diagnose something called ALD, or adrenoleukodystrophy. So, in humans, this, and many other organisms, this causes hormone production failure, nerve and brain damage, and infertility. Um, and this results from the failure in both the uptake and the breakdown of long chain fatty acids, or just fats. Um, the results in the large fat aggregates inside of the cells, and this causes the, the effects of the disease. So this will maybe become a giant blob. Um, and we believe that elect electrorotation can observe this, because these blobs will affect the ion flow more than these small ones. And therefore, the ele electrorotation spectra, as we saw previously, will be different. Maybe higher or maybe lower, but they will be different. Uh, so if we rotate the cell at different frequencies, as you see here, we will get another curve for the ones with the giant fat blobs instead of those with few fat blobs. 
So we believe that this might be used for to diag diagnose ALD, and this is what we want to test out this semester. So if you think that's interesting, just come, maybe join Lively Lab. So hello, welcome. My name is Jan. I'm a physics student here at the university. So for the past few months, I've been working with Anniken and Vilna on a project which tries to combine two quite trendy fields of science. So biology and microfluidics. Uh, with the help of our supervisor team, Doug and Tuma, we honestly had a lot of fun. So let's talk about it. Right. If you're anything like I was, before I started this project, then you'll likely have never heard of cell culturing or microfluidics, right? So uh, cell culturing, it's the idea that when you have a batch of cells, you want to continuously reuse them. Uh, so what you have to do is you just have to make sure they're well fed, that they're not overcrowded. So essentially, it's like babysitting cells, right? But you know, the benefit of working with cells is that they, if they misbehave, you can just get a new batch. So. <laughs> On the other hand, you've got microfluidics. Uh, the way I like to describe it is it's like a pipe network, but on a very small scale, right? So here on this uh, picture here, let's see if this works. There we go. You can see here, uh, it looks a bit like an electronic circuit, but these aren't actually lines, they're channels, right? So we can pump fluids through those holes and they will come out the other side. Uh, but why do we actually care about microfluidic technology at all? Uh, well. Cell culturing is frankly quite tedious, right? Biological labs, they have dedicated uh, lab assistants who do this every day almost. Uh, it takes up a lot of time when you're working with a lot of cells, again, it takes up a lot of time. Uh, so the idea with microfluidic technology is it allows precise control of fluids and allows you to automate the cell culturing process, right? So, and if you ask me, if you allow people to be more lazy, then that's a good thing. Just imagine what the car did for society. It's also a very flexible technology, right? So if, if you're trying to work on some biological experiment, you can actually tailor make a microfluidic chip just for your experiment. Right, so now that we know a little bit about what we're actually doing, let's, uh, we try to set some goals, uh, my uh, partners and I. Uh, so anytime you're working with uh, complicated technology, uh, you have to start very simple, right? So goal number one, have cells attach and survive inside a chip for an extended period of time, right? Once you've done that, you can start having a bit more fun. Uh, so we were thinking, how can you change the environmental parameters of cell cultures and how can you see how they will behave, right? So goal number two, we wanted to do experiments on cell cultures using different concentrations of drugs, right? Pharmaceutical companies, they do this all the time, right? but they do this by hand, right? And in theory, with microfluidic technology, you can just press a button to start the flow and the machine will do it all for you. Uh, we also wanted to try to control some other variables, so we wanted to implement some heating elements uh, to control temperature as well. Uh, so once we figured out what we wanted to do, our supervisors essentially threw some uh, cells and gave us a procedure and we started cell culturing, right? Uh, so here you can see uh, the procedure we had to work with, right? Uh, it doesn't look like a lot, but when you're working with a lot of cells, it can take uh, a lot of time. Uh, so the cells we were given, they were actually cancer cells. And you might be thinking, why cancer cells, right? Uh, don't worry, it's not dangerous. We didn't ingest them or anything. Uh, but we usually, so when we got the cells, we, uh, we got them in a flask, flask here. Uh, it's a specially made biological flask, right? So it's meant to contain these. Under the microscope, you can actually see the cells here. And I quite like this image here because you can actually tell when the cells are happy and when they're unhappy, as we like to say, right? Cells don't have emotions. They can't be happy. Uh, but when they are happy, right, what they do is they start sticking to the walls, right? And that means they're stretching, right? So these really uh, stretchy boys over here, right, these guys here, they're super happy, right? These round ones here, they're they, uh, they've kept their spherical structure, so they're, uh, they're likely unhappy, probably due to uh, overcrowdedness. Uh, so meanwhile, we're working on cell culturing. We've started designing as well. 
uh, the microfluidic chips. Here you can see an example of one of our designs. Uh, that's what's called a gradient generator. Uh, the idea here is if you've got two different fluids, you want to mix them in various concentrations, and then you want to have cell cultures. Uh, you, you, want to affect, uh, you want it to affect different cell cultures, right? So uh, two fluids, they go in here. That's uh, what we call out in inlets, I mean. Uh, and then through the power of hydrodynamics over here, they mix in various concentrations where they end up in these cell chambers right here, and that's where we'll keep the cells and study them under the microscope. Uh, so after we had figured out all the kinks of this design and we were happy with it, uh, we could actually start manufacturing the chip, right? Uh, so that's where we usually uh, did all the work. Uh, it's a type of workbench. And uh, so when we ordered it, sorry, uh, sorry, so we got sent the design uh, to us in, uh, in a kind of, it's called a mask. It's like a type of, it looks like an old style film, you know? Uh, so what we uh, did to actually use this design was we got a silicon wafer, we coated it with uh, a bunch of resin, and then we used a process called photolithography to actually etch the pattern into the silicon wafer. So what we essentially made was a mold, you know, like for when blacksmiths, when they make something, they make a mold first, you know. Uh, after that, we started casting it, right? But instead of using metal, we uh, used a type of liquid polymer. Uh, and eventually this polymer, it solidifies, right? But it's still easy to cut out. So when you cut it out, what you have is a microfluidic chip. All right, so here's uh, one of the first tests we did of uh, said microfluidic chip here. Uh, you can see on the bottom uh, just uh, some blue liquid. On the top, you can see some air. And uh, just watch how it fills the entire device. And as the air is coming in, watch the gradient generator do its magic. You can see on the top chamber how the, there's more air than uh, in the other chambers. And you can see various concentrations of air to blue liquid. So the, the test worked. We're happy. Uh, eventually, we started, uh, eventually, we wanted to insert some cells as well into the chip. Uh, so here's an image right after we inserted some cells. Uh, it's, uh, they don't attach that fast. Uh, so after about an hour, they actually attached. So success, we're happy. Uh, in fact, the cells are also happy. So much so that you can see that this one seems to be dividing, right? So close to dividing. But unfortunately, something went very, very wrong. The cells died, right? So what happened there? This black bar here, that's actually the outline of an air bubble, right? So one of the uh, many challenges that we faced during our project was actually uh, having to deal with bubbles, right? Because you think bubbles, they're really small. Who cares about them, right? But when you've got tiny bubbles inside of a tiny chip, they can cause a lot of trouble, right? So eventually, we, uh, uh, after a lot of pain and tears, we uh, made a sort of procedure where we were essentially just a lot more careful in how we change fluids and insert cells. Uh, and we figured out how to avoid most bubbles. Uh, another unexpected challenge that we had was actually getting cells to attach in the first place, right? Uh, because they were attaching fine inside the flask and they were happy there. But once we inserted them into the chip, for some reason they just didn't feel like uh, cooperating with us, right? So our, uh, our supervisors eventually, they told us, you know, you can just coat the inside of the chip with collagen and see if that helps. So we did that and uh, we went from this to that quite quickly. So in um, overcoming all these challenges, we felt like we had learned a lot, you know? We understood a bit more about what, uh, what we can and cannot do with microfluidics. Uh, so we started looking to the future, right? We've already got plenty of designs that we want to try out. You can see here an example of one such design. Um, uh, the idea there actually is that uh, we usually flow, it just goes right through a microfluidic device. Uh, I really want to try out uh, a type of design that makes it loop around inside the uh, design instead. So I'm not sure if that will work, but uh, we'll see. That's why we need to test it out. Uh, we also want to collaborate more closely with the other groups, uh, mostly because we're, we've all been working individually and by ourselves, uh, but we've been in talks with the bioactuator group to see if we can incorporate some of their uh, muscle cells into the chips and if we can have some fun with that. Uh, and ultimately, most importantly probably, we want to get more students involved. So if this sounds interesting, if you think microfluidics is a very complicated word and you want to learn more about it, just hit us up.
Right? I don't think I've ever thought to myself, man, I wish I had less manpower. So get involved. Thanks for listening. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Thomas. I'm uh, one of the four postdocs which have been uh, supervising uh, some of the groups here at the, for the Lag Live Lab. And also, uh, I was a lot part of actually making this lab because uh, one year from now, actually, this, the room that we are using now was completely empty. It was used for student studies or to hosting master students. And uh, you can see that now, actually, it's, uh, we have a very nice, yeah, that's the pointer. We have a very nice facility where we can actually do real biological studies in there. So we mounted all of this, and so now we are able to, for instance, cultivate cells and do basic studies, and also we have all access to microscopic tools and everything like that to do uh, every kind of simple or not too advanced biological studies, so enough to do multidisciplinary uh, studies in, bio, in, bio, in biology. So here you can see what it looks like, and the good thing is that how we are hosted in the physics building, we have also access to a lot of facilities uh, that belong to the physics. Uh, for instance, we have access to 3D printer, we have access to a lot of microscopes, and that's what makes the Lively Lab also very interesting, is that it's a biological thing hosted at physics, and so it's multidisciplinary by its core already. And uh, so I think that's a very interesting place uh, to look. On to, on to work in. And also we have a lot of partnership with, so Doug mentioned it already, with other labs, so very specific biologic, biologic lab like the HGH Center of Excellence, for instance, but also with startups which are working in biology or with uh, kind of uh, multidisciplinary studies. Uh, just in short to present uh, so who we are, so here are the four postdocs which we are, I think, mainly supervising the different projects that we have here. So just to present them shortly, even though it has been done before by the groups. Here you have Kayoko, which is working at the Hybrid Technology Hub, and which is at the back of the room there, uh, which is mainly uh, focused in biology and who is a bio biomedical engineer. Uh, you have Denis here, uh, who is a biochemist, and which is also more, sp more uh, specialized in biology, and which were also working in the bioactuator project. Uh, we had the help of Oliver, who is a physicist, uh, which works at the physics building in the Oslo Bio Impedance and Medical Technology Group, which were part of the electro rotation project. And there is uh, me, and I'm a biophysicist, and I'm also working at the physics center, and I was taking care of uh, the microfilic project. So now, uh, we are just going to give you a bit of feedback of how us postdoc we are actually trying to manage starting project with students in something which has never been done before here. And so for that, I'm going to give the word to Dennis. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Dennis. Uh, thank you so much for nice introduction of us here, the supervisors of uh, this very nice uh, initiative. Uh, so our goals in here were uh, especially uh, to give the very basic training so that uh, these students could fly their projects, could uh, uh, become uh, comfortable in the lab, could uh, grow their cells, and also uh, uh, running their experiments in a very uh, independent way. So we gave some technical support not not to not not so much because these guys are amazing they really um, uh, took care of the, their projects so we we also try to answer any questions uh, to give some suggestions and feedback and of course uh, we also received lots of uh, feedback and it was amazing to see the evolution of, of the students uh, and how did it work? So uh, initially, uh, we we start to to meet uh, is, is still uh, online because it was in the highest part of the pandemics, but uh, somehow it still worked very well uh, because uh, I think the enthusiasm is uh, the main thing. And then we start. W we could finally. Uh, 
enter in the lab, uh, gather, and start with the uh, initial uh, practical classes about uh, how to grow cells and everything very basic, but uh, an aseptic, aseptic technique that is uh, something very important because you imagine you, you, go, you, you have in, in, in a cell media, you have lots of sugar. You have uh, inside the incubator, uh, it is uh, 37 degrees, a humid place, very nice for bacteria, but uh, we, don't, we don't want bacteria to, uh, to infect our cells, so it's very challenging. And uh, you have to have all this uh, care when, when you take care of uh, cell cultures. And these guys uh, learned very quickly. Um, then they, they presented this uh, self-motivation. They became independent. They started to come by themselves in the lab. Uh, and uh, lots of creativity. It's amazing because uh, they started for, from uh, just reading uh, some papers. And then they started to, to fly their own ideas, to have uh, their um, on uh, designs, etc., uh, and the outcome was amazing because the, the students learned quickly, as I, I mentioned, uh, were independent, uh, and and uh, now I can I can tell you they are comp uh, 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 competent in cell culture, electrical stimulation, uh, and as you just saw here by their presentations, they have uh, a very high degree of scientific thinking. That's very important. And for us, the supervisor, uh, a majority of us are uh, postdoc students, so um, uh, postdoc researchers. For us, it's an amazing opportunity uh, to develop our skills as well as, as, well as uh, supervisors and uh, to develop some uh, leadership skills. Uh, it was uh, rewarding to see uh, uh, this uh, growing so fast uh, of, of these uh, young people that are going to be uh, our future researchers, especially in this, uh, in this area that is uh, so needed, like people in the interface between biological science and physics. And uh, finally, uh, the, the feeling of uh, taking part and also helping to launch uh, this great program uh, that uh, because it's a privilege for us to be the you know the, just uh, the first ones to participate of this and uh, and for sure uh, it has a bright future ahead so uh, that's it from from my part and join us. <laughs> Thank you very much for the great presentations. Thank you to the audience for, for listening to us. Uh, just one thing, we've been saying physics and life science all the time, but we, this is open not only to physicists and, and biology students, but to all science students at the University of Oslo. Mathematics, and, and informatics, chemistry, pharmacy, what in or in or others, it does not require special competences. Many of these were first year students when they started. Mm -hmm. And then t at the end, I'll leave the word to the director of Oslo Light and UIO Life Science. Thanks. So uh, my name is Karl Henrik Urbits. As you heard, I am director of UIO Life Science, UIO Livsvidenskap på norsk. Uh, we were fortunate to have our logo on one of the first slides. If you didn't notice. Uh, I've been, I've been uh, the director of this strategic uh, initiative for three years. Uh, I've been visiting, uh, in fact, several, but at the, there is a makerspace that Doug mentioned at the Norwegian Technical Museum. Uh, one of the first places I visited as a director was at the Norwegian Technical University at NTNU. And this is about computers and 3D printing, and they said to me, well, you're into life sciences, shouldn't you have a biomaker space? Yes, we should. Uh, do you have one? No. Um, so this has been bothering us for some time that we uh, 
should have one, but we didn't. And we were thinking, um, how do we go about establishing this? And this was bothering us for some time. So in addition to supporting research, innovation, and education at this university with an inter interdisciplinary profile, everything, we also have some strategic support opportunities. And suddenly, we had an email from these guys asking, uh, we were thinking about establishing a biomaker space. Uh, is it possible for us to apply to UI of Life Science for support? And we said, yes, please. And they did. And I must say today, it's been very interesting to see these presentations. Uh, I'm very happy that this has come about and appears to be, from what I can tell, very successful, something that we can follow up in the future. Uh, we've been giving applause to the students well-deserved uh, to the supervisors, also well-deserved. There is one group of people who have not yet been applauded, and they are the people who took this initiative. So I would like to, I, I would like everyone to give a big hand to the wonderful supervisors and the initiative, Dag, Orion, and uh, Stefan, who's not here, I think. Uh, thank you very much for taking this initiative, and we're very interested to see how this continues.